Ken, I think most of you know me again, Howard Callahan, Nutrient Management Program with Department of Ag. Um, as of January, things have changed a little bit in the state as far as what territory I cover and maybe some other people. I am currently, as of now, doing Caroline County, Talbot County, and Queen Anne's County. I do not do Kent County as of the first of the year. Basically, we have a gentleman by the name of Nick Miller that's doing Kent and Cecil for people in here, maybe in that region. So just a new face. Um, he'll be perfect because I trained him. Um, so you shouldn't have any problems. But on top of that, I'm now also, in addition to my three counties, I am supervising four other specialists. So the whole shore, plus one in Baltimore and Hartford. So if you got a problem, reach out. That's all I can tell you. As far as nutrient management, again, I'm going to go through a, few, a lot of things. Some things I'm going to go through rather quickly because they don't pertain to a lot of you. Um, again, if you've got a question, let, let me know. So again, uh, talk about some land application requirements, AIR submissions again, Darren <laughs> alluded to briefly for 2022. We mailed them out about mid-January. They were due March 1, which is here and gone. I know most of you have probably done it. I'm gonna say all of you've done it, but I'm sure that's not true. Um, but so if you've forgotten, get on it. We need to get them. You'll get a friendly slash unfriendly reminder from us about the 1st of April if you don't do it. Um, but so, and then again, PMT soil data, that's nothing new. Nutrient application setbacks, nothing new. The current nutrient management plan report form. Again, some regional office contacts, because again, we've had some changes in staffing. One thing that did change was um, if you're using soil amendments, which is anything that's not commercial fertilizer in our world or it's not true animal, pure animal manure, in other words, it would be spent mushroom soil, it would be some kind of compost, it's food waste residuals. Those products are required to have a registration with the state chemist's office, which is through the Maryland Department of Ag. That is not new, that has been the case. But as of now, as of January, if we come out to review you and you're using those products, you gotta have a copy of that current registration as part of your records. So if you're getting those products, generally you're gonna be getting them from someone else, say, hey, I gotta have a copy of the registration. So that is kinda new. Um, again, we've had some changes just to clarify some seasons. I'll get into that. Um, so some new, new incorporation guidelines dealing with food waste. Uh, because we had issues with a lot of those products are pretty odiferous, I'll call it, they stink. Um, <laughs> so, so basically trying to cure some of that to try to be better neighbors, if that's the right word, there were some changes in that. <clears throat> so again, imported organic fertilizers, again, that provide primary nutrients, again, such as processing food waste, residual spent mushroom substrate, spray irrigation, wastewater, compost, other waste streams, Again, required to have that current registration. That's always been the case. That's a legal requirement. We're just now going to expect you to have a copy of that in your possession. Again, I think most of us know what cover crops are. <clears throat> but again, the, the regulations that changed as of the first of the year were focused only on food processing residuals. And again, it means an organic material generated by processing ag commodities for human or animal consumption. The term includes food residuals, food co-products, food processing waste, food processing sludges, or any other incidental material whose characteristics are derived from processing ag products for human or animal consumption. The ones we run into mostly on the shore are related to, to poultry processing waste. Um, they, they, they generally end up on land application. It's more prevalent lower part of the shore where you get closer to the poultry processing, but it is there. So again, those are the ones that have got some new incorporation requirements. Again, if it's a food processing waste, in other words, it's one of those products, but it's run through a digester to digest, it's exempt from that incorporation. Again, animal and poultry manures are not part of that. Class A and B biosolids, which would be sludge biosolids that goes for land application, they're not part of that. If a product is truly composted, it's not part of that. Spent mushroom soil does not fall under the food processing residuals. It's got to have the registration, but it's not going to be under the incorporation requirement. And then again, water treatment plant residuals. I've never encountered them in my region, but I know they happen in other parts of the state. In our regulations, there's always been kind of seasons, if that's the right word. <clears throat> we, we, we broaden that a little bit, a little bit. I guess when we regulations were changed. Used to be in there we just had spring, summer, and winter. So now we've got a summer. 
because spring used to be, it was just a kind of the category we used, ran from March through September. So we just broke it out and said March through June, July to September, and it's just to help clarify some things that'll make sense maybe as I proceed. <clears throat> Again, then this is nothing new. So if you're in the spring season and a person may make a nutrient application during the springtime period for an existing crop, so you're fertilizing your wheat, you're fertilizing your hay, it's existing or a crop that you're going to plant during this period. So I'm going to plant corn, I'm going to plant soybeans. So you can go out there anytime after March 1, according to your nutrient management plan, and legally apply your nutrients that you need. Again, as it's always been, you're not allowed to be doing nutrient application when the soil is saturated. Common sense, most of you aren't going to be out there because it is saturated. But unfortunately, when you're dealing with waste stream products that got to go somewhere on a regular basis, the agronomic side gets thrown out the window. We're, we're, they're wanting to apply them under the agronomic umbrella under a nutrient management plan, but they're not really worried about the agronomic. So that got put in there just to keep from doing that. <clears throat> so again, I just say if there's, because I mean, I actually witnessed, it's hard to believe, water in the field, on the ground, and the guy's running through it, spraying more wastewater. You think, how can that be? I mean, we're on a sandy piece of ground that would hold a lot of water, I guess. A man had a thunderstorm. You know, we can't do those kind of things. It just gets people riled up, to say the least. <clears throat> so again, organic nutrient sources other than food processing waste. Again, if you're still, it's just like it's been, if you're a no-till operation, you don't have to incorporate. But if any organic nutrient source, whether it's food processing waste or chicken litter or whatever, it's again, it's an organic nutrient source. If you're not a true 100% no-till operation and you're gonna do any tillage, including vertical tillage, you're required to incorporate in 48 hours. That is not new. That has been there for years. It's just a reminder. So again, back to the food processing residuals. Again, for all crops except pasture or hay fields, a person applying these products shall directly inject the material into the soil or incorporate the material into soil as soon as possible but no later than the end of the day the application is made. So in a nutshell, these more offensive products have now got to be injected, or before the day is over, you've got to have them thoroughly incorporated. Again, if it's incorporated, it must result in at least 95% soil coverage. So you shouldn't see much of anything land on the surface. Again, which means heavy disking, chisel plowing, so forth, so on. <clears throat> that, is, that is the new stuff. Again, if it's hay or pasture, we're not going to make you de destroy that. Again, it's not going to be a lot of that, but there is some of that around. Again, a hay and pasture field is defined that has at least 75% vegetation, which may be a mix of grass and legumes. Kind of the same logic, you know, you're saying, well, that's what a hay field should look like. Again, unfortunately, you ran into these situations where operators, somebody, was applying these products on fields that, hey, this is hay. Well, if you could even find some sparse weeds, you were doing good, you know. So we had to clarify that that does not qualify for hay. So you're not under that exemption. Again, and so then in the summertime frame, again, <clears throat> so that was the spring. So in the summer, again, a person may make a nutrient application during the summer for, for an existing crop. So I'm fertilizing my corn crop for its second application. Um, fertilizing my hay crop, again, for a crop that's already planted or that will be planted. So again, trying to tighten up the windows because of the problems we ran into. You go out there and say, I'm going to apply nutrients on August the 1st. You've all probably seen it. People leave fields fallow. So someone can pay them to pick this waste product. <clears throat> so if you're going to go out there and put it on, on August the 1st, you gotta be planting the crop by September the 9th. That's now a requirement. So you just can't be putting it on and leaving land fallow. It can be as simple as a cover crop, but it's gotta at least have some cover. Again, you can't do it when it's saturated. Um, so that's nothing new. Organic nutrient sources other than food processing weights. Again, this is the 48 hours incorporation, same old thing. Again, food processing residuals. Again, we're back in that summer time frame. Again, everything except hay and pasture. And it says it must be incorporated as soon as possible, just like the other, by the end of the day, 95% soil coverage. Again, so now it says uh, a person shall plant a harvestable crop. So again, if you remember back, it's by no later than September the 9th, so you can't put stuff on in the middle of the summer and leave it fallow. You've got to plant a harvestable crop or a cover crop no later than 14 days after the application to the field is complete. 
Again, it's trying to logic to say we're putting it out for nutrient sources. We're trying to capture it if there's any way possible to keep it from getting away. So a crop or a cover crop at a minimum. Again, pasture field is still that same old 75% cover at a minimum. Like always, if there's an emergency due to an imminent overflows, this, that, and the other, you need to contact your regional specialist. We will work through those situations because we don't want that to happen, but it's hopefully not a regular occurrence. Again, so same thing. Now in the fall period, it's the same thing. You can apply chemical fertilizer in this period if you got a need. That's the nutshell. You can apply poultry litter in the fall for an existing crop. So again, if I was had hay that was already growing or a crop that I'm going to plant. So I can put poultry litter on in October for wheat that I'm going to plant. Again, but it's in accordance with your plan. <clears throat> you cannot apply poultry litter in the fall of the year for next year's crop. If that makes sense to you. And we wouldn't want to agronomically, but those are things that we have to regulate in today's world. Again, organic nutrient sources other than poultry litter. So now we're compost, we're spent mushroom soil, we're dairy manure. Um, again, a fall application can be made for an existing crop or a plot crop planted, again, during the fall period or the following spring. So in this scenario, if it's not chicken litter, you can actually apply all the way up and through December the 15th for a crop that's next year. The requirement again is you're going to have be planting cover crop and then your summer crop has to be planted no later than June 1. We're just trying to get away from this putting it on and not growing something. That, that's the intent of that. <clears throat> so then the same thing. So now we're again nutrient application is still prohibited when it's saturated. No different. Uh, other than food processing residuals, again, it's incorporated within 48 hours, same old thing. So now food processing residuals, those are the, the, the products that we talked about at the beginning, like the poultry plant processing waste. There's some milk plant waste I see in other parts or hear about in other parts of the state. So now in the fall period, which is running September the 10th through October the 31st, just for this scenario, again, <clears throat> for all crops except hay's pasture, fruit processing residuals shall directly inject into the soil, incorporate by the end of the day. Again, 95% coverage, same words as before. <clears throat> and then it says, a person shall plant a harvestable crop or a cover crop no later than 14 days after the application. So these things again. So in that scenario, if he's putting it on October the 31st, by November the 14th, he's got to have something growing there. <clears throat> Again, November the 1st through the end of February, which it really should say November the 1st, in my opinion, through the end of de through December the 15th, because that's really the end of our application allowances. <clears throat> so again, if it's a non-injectable food processing residual, because some of these products are capable of being injected and some are more thick, so they're really surface applied. Kind of like a dairy slurry is kind of my measurement of them to some degree. So from November to 1 through the last day of February, well basically through November 1 through December the 15th, a person may not apply a non-injectable food residual. So in other words, those food residuals can no longer be applied if it can't be injected after October the 31st. If it's injectable, then they can go from November the 1st again through December the 15th. Again, they have to inject into a soil growing with an existing crop or an existing cover crop. So in this scenario, it's allowing them to go a little bit later in the year because needless to say, that industry barked really loud when they said, you're going to cut me off on October the 31st and I got to find a place to store all of this until next March. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty big impact in places. So I guess we'll say a compromise was reached and say, if you can get it injected, you put it in something in cover, we'll work with you. So that's the bulk of what I see in today's world is getting injected. I think it's been a process that we've persuaded those, that industry, over the last several years because of all the complaints we were getting that they were already kind of heading there and this was just kind of sealing the deal to some degree. So that's really the only thing new. Again, winter's temporary stockpiling, that's dealing with chicken litter and all those products that can be stockpiled. Again, <clears throat> we work with people in emergencies, nutrients that are considered stackable in our world are no more than 75% moisture content, so if they're over that, in reality you need storage. Again, temporary staging is allowed. Again, less than 75% moisture when other, other options really don't exist. Again, winter, so from December the 16th through the end of February, or in theory March 1, 
again, if you got on-farm generated manure, operators are, you know, and you, and you basically need to spread because you got an emergency. In other words, I don't have enough storage or I've, I ran into a situation. You got to work with us. But in the reality, if you're doing this on a regular basis and we don't have enough storage, in other words, my storage is inadequate, then we're going to let you go in an emergency situation. But if you got adequate storage, you got to stack, you know, store it. If it's stackable, you got to stack it. Again, you need an emergency, you need to contact your regional specialist. Again, if you're doing things in an emergency, there's more restrictions. So they got to be at least 100 foot from surface water. They can't go on slopes greater than 7%, which I don't think you're going to find in this region, but they're certainly in the state. Again, you can't be out there when there's more than an inch of snow. You can't be out there if the ground's frozen more than two inches deep. And there's restrictions, and if they're in a winter situation, they're limited to 50 pounds of nitrogen or crop phosphorus removal of the crop that they're going to grow. So there's restrictions if they are out there in the winter. They can't do the same thing they could do other times of the year. AIRs, annual reports. <clears throat> Again, due March 1. Um, formatting was changed a few years ago, so for the last several years they've looked the same. You're still seeing the same green form. Um, <clears throat> no new questions been added. We're encouraging electronic submittals, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But in a, in a nutshell, again, your AIR must be complete, must be signed. Um, if they're not submitted by March 1, they're subject to further enforcement based on the past. I don't see this year being any different. About the 1st of April, we'll send a warning reminder. If you didn't turn it in, it's going to give you still probably 10 to 15 days to get it done. We're going to work with you. We want to get the, we, we got to get the paperwork. That's the bottom line. But for the hand few that don't, there are monetary penalties. <clears throat> Again, forms that are submitted incomplete may be subject to an implementation review. If your form comes in and it's incomplete, high probability you're at least going to get a phone call to try to get it figured out now. And depending on what we see and what we don't see, you're going to float to the top of getting a review in the next few months. <clears throat> so do yourself a favor, try to do it right. Ask questions. This is the electronic AIR and all your packets that you were mailed last year and this year too, we are strongly encouraging to do them electronically through this one-stop portal. I would say last year 50, 60 percent probably did that. I mean it's about where we are. This year it's, I'm not sure. I'm just so far behind I don't know where I stand hardly. <laughs> so anyhow it gives you instructions but again you would go through this one-stop portal. This one-stop portal houses a lot of stuff for the state government. It's more than just a nutrient management annual report. But again, it tells you how to register. You go in, you set up an account. And once you get the account set up, it's there for you forever, I guess, as long as you don't forget your password. Um, if you forget your password, then that's, we have to go through and reset it and go again. But <clears throat> so basically, you would go in, once you get into that portal and you get set up, you go in and in this search bar, you put in AIR nutrient management, you hit the little search icon. And it's going to bring you up that form because if you look, there will be, I don't know how many forms are in there, but there's a lot of forms in there that ain't got nothing to do with nutrient management. So you've got to get the right one is the bottom line. <clears throat> Again, the electronic submission of the AIR to MDA, or in this case your specialist, as soon as you submit your AIR successfully, I guess that's the right word, within minutes you will get an automated email confirmation from OneStop that says the AIR was received. So then you can at least rest assured that it went somewhere. Hopefully it went where it needed to go. <laughs> but, and then ultimately what happens, that because so for an example, if you put in there, it's Queen Anne's County, when you go in this database, it's because it's going to ask you the county, it's going to submit it and I'm going to get an email that comes to me and says so and so has submitted an annual report through the one stop portal on this date. So I get an email notice for anything that's going to be clicked Caroline County, Queen Anne's County, or Talbot County. If you're in Cecil County, then that same thing is going to go my coworker Nick. <clears throat> so once it comes through, again, we're going to review it, hopefully in a timely fashion. Uh, like I told Jenny today, I'm currently up to February the 26th. In other words, I'm doing the oldest and working my way up, so I'm, what, six, eight days behind at this point, give or take a little. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> So I have people asking me, well, how come I didn't get approval? But once, once you get the confirmation that it's sent, at least you should be able to rest assured that it's been sent. 
Again, once it's reviewed by your specialist, it's going to be one of two things. It's either going to be approved and you're going to get an email that it's approved, or you're going to get an email back that says there's corrections needed and it's going to say, please look at number 60 because something, 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 you know. Again, let you go back to your portal. You're going to see that form that you had submitted to me originally and it's going to be sitting back there for you to retrieve. You can go in, make the changes, and then you have to resubmit it back to me. <clears throat> so we're getting there. So again, uh, once, the read, it's, once it's approved, you'll receive an email that the AIR is accepted and complete. Keep that email with your records, because at least that's your 100% proof that we're good to go. <clears throat> again, operator saves postage, because um, we've all had postage issues. Again, last year and this year currently, if you actually do it online um, as a certified operator, or someone that holds an applicator voucher, which a lot of you are probably here today, you will actually receive two continuing education unit credits, which will take care of your voucher needs by just doing this electronically. It's just an incentive to do it that way. Again, if you need help, reach out. You know, we, will, we want to encourage you to get there. Once that AIR is approved, all that information you have given is going directly into a database, which is information that we've always put in a database, that when we have to give reports to the governor or we have to give reports to someone else, we aggregately can have all that data to say, we had X number of acres of corn, we had X number of tons of manure that was imported into the state, exported out of the state, used in the state, put on corn, put on beans. <clears throat> so it's important that when we approve it, it looks like good information. You know, I know some people think probably we're nitpicking, but I don't want to put something in that says I got, when the guy's got 159.5 acres of cropland, but then he puts down I got 159,500 acres that had 60% cover. I mean, so it's, that's, but those are the things I see, you know, so I just say, well, we got to try to fix it. We have the capability of editing your form. We try to avoid that at all costs, but if worse comes to worse, we can edit. If I had to pick up the phone and call you and you say, please fix it, I can make an edit, but it is not approved because it has to go back to you. You have to sign it and you have to send it back. So it's a challenge. So I'd rather convince you to try to fix it on your own, but we can get there. <clears throat> Again, PMT, nothing new, just reiterating the fact regulations went into effect in 2015. They were phased in over six years, which meant they went into full effect in July of 2021, so we're well into that. PMT, phosphorus management tool, that's dealing with fields that have excessive phosphorus and you're still trying to apply phosphorus. Something in your plan, just reminding people that it's here, we're there, it, you know, we got to work with it. Again, whatever your plan says is what you're required to do. You keep records of what phosphorus is applied. You keep records of all nutrients. But under PMT, if you're working in the phosphorus situation where you have soil test phosphorus levels of 150 FIV or greater, you are under a phosphorus restriction in the state of Maryland. <clears throat> what that says is if I want to put phosphorus from any source and any method on this crop, on this field, I, my consultant has to do the PMT to look at what's the environmental risk of putting that volume of phosphorus from this source and this method and this time frame on this crop with its situation, where it's, with its soil. So ultimately in that calculation, your consultant's going to do some, it's going to be a, it's a tool that scores a lot of factors. You're ultimately going to end up with a score. Depending on that score, you're going to come out as it's a high risk, it's a medium risk, or it's a low risk. So everybody that's over 150 and supplying P has at least got low risk at a minimum. There's no such thing as zero risk. And if you're low risk, you're limited to phosphorus crop removal over the next three year crop rotation. What that means in a nutshell, <clears throat> if you said, well, I'm gonna grow corn in 2023 and I would like to put three tons of chicken litter on it. Again, that three tons of chicken later, maybe your phosphorus start or whatever is calculated in that PMT. If it comes out as low risk, it's going to say you can do that, but you're limited to crops that I anticipate to grow looking into the future. So it would be corn this year. Maybe it's going to be wheat and beans the next year. Maybe I'm back to corn in the third year. So again, your consultant is going to calculate crop phosphorus removal based on anticipated goals, yield goals. 
of how much that would be. And all it's doing is it's saying, I will let you put all your phosphorus on the first year in that crop if you so desire. But be aware, you just restricted yourself from applying any additional phosphorus for the next two years. So it's giving you flexibility, but you just need to know what it is. So you might, you might decide, well, let me put my three tons. I'm making stuff up. I'll put three tons of chicken litter on this year, which is 150 pounds of phosphorus. Eh, it's going to be wheat and beans next year. I won't put any. I want to go back to corn in the third year, and maybe you only got 100 pounds of phosphorus left in the bag, if that makes sense, because you were limited to three years' worth of crop removal. So in year three, you may have to cut back to two tons. Maybe you want to think and say, well, let me cut the first year back to two tons and keep me two tons the next year or two and a half each year. So it's things you just need to ask your consultant about because you do have a restriction. If you are medium risk, it's limited you to annual crop phosphorus removal. So what it's saying in that scenario, if I'm going to grow corn this year, I've got a 200 bushel yield goal, which is hopefully realistic. There's going to be a calculation off the top of my head. I think that's 80 pounds of phosphorus. So you would be limited to a maximum of 80 pounds of phosphorus in a medium risk scenario. So that might be a ton and a half of chicken litter, which means you can't put two tons. If you're high risk, it flat out cuts you off. It says you cannot do this. And again, what I tell farmers is talk to your consultant, go in with it and express to them, this is my desire. I would like to put a couple of tons of chicken litter. I would like to put this starter on, which has this much phosphorus. <clears throat> and let them calculate it and see if it's acceptable. A lot of times it probably will be. Um, but if you run it and it basically, we can't get the risk down to at least a medium, it's going to say you can't do it. There's factors. There's a lot of factors and some things you can change and some things you can't easily change. <clears throat> just be aware. Again, that's the technical user's guide. This is just talking about surface water. Surface water, you know, is uh, in our world is perennial intermittent streams as a rule. There's a few other little nuances that sometimes get in, but most ditches are not into this setback requirement. <clears throat> so again, there's setbacks calculated in PMT. There's setbacks calculated for nutrient application. And to make it more confusing, what counts in surface water in one doesn't necessarily count as surface water in the other. But that's what your consultant is educated for and has been certified to do. So just ask questions. But again, it's all that's going to be spelled out in your plan. If you need one, you deal with it. Um, Again, if you have livestock on pasture and they got access to a stream, that's going to be an issue. Again, it doesn't apply to most of you, but it does in other parts of the world. Again, if you have to have a setback, um, it's going to be anywhere from 10 to 35 foot, depending on what your method of nutrient application is. In a nutshell, if you're required to have a nutrient application setback, you've got to have at least 10 foot that's going to be some kind of vegetation. You can let it grow up in weeds. We don't care. Um, but it's got to be at least 10 foot, and that's assuming that you're anything outside of 10 foot, between 10 and 35, you're only going to ban nutrients, so you can't be broadcasting them. If you, if you were broadcasting nutrients, then it actually requires you to have a 35 foot setback, as you see up there. <clears throat> that's slinging it, you know, a little more slop method, I'll call it. Again, setbacks for livestock, again, I don't think it's relevant to most of us. Again, it requires, you know, to keep them out of the stream, so they got to have fencing or unless there's some other alternative that the soil conservation can come up with in your water quality plan. You know, sometimes streams crossing, alternative watering. There's other things, but in most cases, if you got livestock and got access to a stream, it's going to be a fence. There's a lot of cost share help through the districts to do this. In today's world, I think in most cases, it's 100% cost share, so you can't go wrong. There's also some programs that I've heard about but I don't know much about, again through the district, that will pay you a pretty good a volume amount of, for taking land out of production that you lost because that wasn't always been an argument. Well one, I don't want to fence and two, I just lost another acre of land, you know, with no compensation. So there is some things out there if you're in that situation, talk to the district, explore them. Again, that just gives you a visual, assuming this was something that needed a setback, of kind of how we would calculate it. Current plan cert forms, nothing new, something that's been around for several years. If you apply for anything as cost share, I'll say generally through the max office. Cover crop is a big one. 
but it could be stream crossings and fencing and manure buildings and whatever else it would be, you're required to be in compliance with nutrient management. And one of those things is making sure I have a current plan. And instead of you bringing your plan in to show the district or whoever else, because there was concern that it would get potentially open to Freedom of Information Act if the district had it. So to alleviate some of that, it was this magic form is the tool that's used. And all it is is like what they call a current nutrient management plan certification form. Every time you get your plan done or updated, your consultant should give you that. That's just in a routine. If they don't give you one, ask for it. Because I'd rather them give it to you six months ahead of time than when you get to the last minute and you're trying to sign up for something and they say, we can't help you because you didn't got that form. You know, and then the consultant's gone or dead or whatever, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so again, basically in a nutshell, your consultant's just filling out your information, name, address, their, their information as far as who they are, their certain number, when they wrote the plan, when it ends, how many acres is in it. They're signing it. They're going to give it to you. You, the farmer, are going to sign this down here that basically says up here, you know, I've got my stuff current, blah, 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 blah. That's what you're going to take in. The third section is for a landowner only that is not operating their land that is getting some kind of cost share. For an example, landowners... Uh, if there's a BMP going on the land, a lot of times it's the landowner doing it. You know, stream crossing, grass waterways, some of those come in. So your landowner might come to you and says, I need a current cert form. What the heck is that? They're going to get it from you because you've got this that your plan writer gave you, you've signed, and then you're going to share it with your landowner, which is going to sign it, that's saying this land in question is covered under a current plan. So just be aware. Landowners can get cover crop cost share as long as you got this, you give them this, and you're not applying for cover crop on it. You know, because there's some of that in the state. There's not a lot, but it does happen. So that form is very important. <clears throat> Again, this is just the latest contact info. Again, just before the end of the year, we added another specialist like myself in our state, throughout the state, and that's actually Emily. So there used to be eight of us, counting myself, and now there's nine of us. Um, this one actually has just started a few weeks ago, so that's no longer vacant. Um, but again, and I'm supervising all of these, including myself. So what changed as of the first year also was if you are a CAFO, which Darren talked about, which probably most of you in here are not, but some of you are, Again, you're looked at in a little different light because you got to do nutrient management compliance with MDA. You also got to do stuff that's a requirement for MDE as far as your permit, which would be your comprehensive nutrient management plan. You've got permit fees. You've got whatever else. You file a different annual report. We send you the we as an MDA sends the annual report that we want you to submit. So if you're a CAFO, you're going to get a different form that looks similar. But it's going to have two logos on the top. It's going to have MDA and MDE instead of just MDA. It's still green in color. The first four pages are identical, but you get two additional pages if you're a CAFO. So if you're a CAFO, you've kind of known what's being asked from you. Again, as of the first of the year, we now have one person that's doing all of the CAFOs in the whole state of Maryland. So if you're a CAFO and you submit your form paper or electronically, it's not going to go to me, even in my three counties, because she is this girl, Robin Culver, which is in Salisbury, is handling all of the CAFOs. So you're going to have some new contact people to some degree. So the bulk of the CAFOs, generally speaking, are on the lower shore where she's at anyhow, because the bulk of them are poultry. <clears throat> but she's handling all the CAFOs. Steve Celeste, which was doing, was doing Carolina and Dorchester counties, is now doing Dorchester and the three lower shore counties that are not CAFOs. <clears throat> I'm doing, again, I'm doing now Caroline, gave up Kent to Nick. Nick, went, Nick came to work for us probably 18 months ago. He was doing Baltimore, Hartford, Cecil. So we added Emily into the mix, and she's just doing Baltimore and Hartford. Out there, nothing has really changed other than a new face. Said a lot of things. Hopefully lunch is getting ready. Anybody got any questions? Again, I'll be here, but don't be bashful. Speak up. Again, if you think you needed an annual report, you ain't sent it in, better be thinking about it. If you lost it, let somebody know. We can get you one. 
You can go online and get one, blank, whatever it would be.